we're going to look at this beautiful cover of Nancy's book, which is coming out September 8th, 2020 from HarperCollins. It is the writer's library, the authors you love on the books that changed their lives. I have a description and I have a really, really good introduction of Nancy Pearl written down. And then I'm going to only say part of it because I have some other nice things to say about Nancy Pearl. Who doesn't really? Um, so, <laughs> best-selling author, librarian, literary critic, and devoted reader, Nancy Pearl regularly speaks about the importance and pleasure of reading at libraries, literacy organizations, and community groups around the world. You can hear her on NPR's Morning Edition. You can watch her monthly show, Book Lust with Nancy Pearl, on the Seattle channel. For those of you who are not in Seattle, it is at seattlechannel.org slash booklust. Um, she has been honored many ways in our profession, which are um, one of which is the 2011 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association. Nancy is the creator of the internationally recognized program, If All of Seattle Read the Same Book. This is a program where we all read the same thing, and many communities across the nation have been doing that for years since Nancy first started that program in Seattle. And she is the inspiration and model for the librarian action figure toy that you can get in many gift shops and in the Archie McPhee, McPhee flagship in Seattle. So welcome, Nancy. Um, time for applause from everyone. We are so glad to have you here. It's great to be here, even virtually. I was looking forward to coming to Massachusetts to see everybody in person, but I'm glad we were able to do this. Me too. I don't know if Kristen's going to turn me back on so that I'm joining you on screen or not. I see you. You can see me? I can't yeah. see. Maybe I need to click on something to see me. <laughs> I've got a 10-year-old off camera telling me how to do it. <laughs> I am. I just want to make sure I'm not making weird expressions and remember to take off my glasses because they have a glare on them. Um, so I got to tell everybody, I promise I'm going to shut up real soon, but I got to tell everybody, I was in library school in Seattle at the University of Washington in 1992. And this was when Nancy was working at the Seattle Public Library as the queen of all reading things or something, some other job title. But I learned about Nancy and I knew about her remotely because I had a student librarian job at the Beacon Hill and Madrona branches of the Seattle Public Library. And I learned about her and I started sort of hearing about her and her passion and her enthusiasm and her guidance for Reader's Advisory Services. And I have been a fan, like a stand up and wave my arms around fan for almost 30 years now most of which I've been a librarian trying to like learn along the way too and and take everything Nancy says and soak it in and put it back out into the world. Many of our attendees here at the Massachusetts Library Association have had occasion to hear me speak the gospel of Nancy Pearl at um, readers advisory roundtables and trainings at the conference and I'm just so 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 happy that I got to meet her for real in the late aughts and we became friends, and I'm so happy to have Nancy in my life and to share her with y'all. Like Nancy, I was so excited to have her come to the conference so that I could take her around and say, you guys, this is Nancy, and you could be her best friend too, because that's what Nancy's superpower is, is to give you the perfect book at the perfect time and to make you feel like you're her best friend, and that's why she does so well. Oh, too nice. Too Nancy, nice. tell us about the writer's library? Well, the writer's library um, was really um, the idea of my co-author, Jeff Schwager. He interviewed me for a project he was working on for the Washington State Jewish Historical Society. They were honoring 20 Jewish women um, around the state of Washington, and I was one of them. And when we started meeting, uh, when, he, when we did the interview, we just discovered we shared this great love of books and you know we had many authors that we both loved john o'hara is one of them and we had many authors that we had little differing opinions about philip roth is one of those and then one day um jeff said by that time it was like he was my little brother um i he said well wouldn't it be fun to just 
you know, go around and interview authors about the books that they love and we could see their libraries and everything. And, you know, I was, I'm a pretty grumpy person, you know, so I said, um, yeah, I guess that would be okay. But, you know, and then gradually we decided to do it. And of course the hard, the, the hard part was we were limited in the number of pages and the number of authors that we could do. And we had to come to some agreement about which authors we would want to interview and which, um, and who we could bear not to interview from the others' lists. Um, and then to see who was available and who was willing to be interviewed. So um, I love, I, I love the final list that we did. There are some very, very well-known writers. There are some writers who I hope through this and through their own writing will become better known. And each interview was, was great fun to do. Um, we, we actually drove all over, to, flew and then drove to these people's, mostly their houses um, to interview them. So, and I think for anybody who's a reader, for anyone who's a writer, I think this is the kind of book that gives you um, inspiration, but it's not academic in any way. It's, it's so much fun. I have, um, I have to congratulate you because the list is inclusive in delightful ways. It is half men and half women. Thank you so much. You're there welcome. There are two married couples in the list. I can't get the book to open on my phone right now. I'm sure my EPUB expired last night and now <laughs> I'm not supposed to be talking about it. I was going to throw out a bunch of names. Um, I, I have some some questions about the, the story of putting this together, but I each each section has an introduction where you dish a little bit about how the right. interview came to be. And then the interview is just like uh, magazine articles that transcribe the conversation. It's like reading a podcast. And that is the highest compliment that I can pay because I don't process information very well that I hear. So okay. reading a podcast is like my favorite thing. <laughs> And the love for books and the, the affection for each other is so obvious in these pieces. It's so much fun. If you have a favorite writer in the table of contents, you'll be just beside yourself with joy. And I think that you will find as a reader many, many authors to love in among these 22 and also among the writers and books that they have been affected by. So tell us a road trip story from you and well, Jeff's adventures. So we were going to interview Richard Ford, everybody, many people on the East Coast. We had to make two different trips to the East Coast because we couldn't get everybody available on, on adjacent days. So we were driving up to Maine to interview Richard Ford, and then we were driving to... Um, we thought to upstate New York to interview Russell Banks, but at the last minute he said, could you come into Saratoga Springs to interview me instead, because that's where I'll be on this particular day. And so we're driving around, um, we're driving around that part of the map where New Hampshire and New York and Vermont and Maine, I mean, everything kind of in, 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 it's like, not like, it's like the four corners, but it's in the upper, you know, the upper Eastern part of the United States. And Waze, who I always rely on to get me everywhere, just sort of gave up, just kind of said, that's it. I can't tell you where to go. And it kept taking us in this circle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, and as, as, as Jeff said, the fact that we got out of that, still speaking to each other and still willing to go on and do more interviews um, was a testament to our uh, good, good humor. So that was one story. My favorite story, there are many stories, and we tell some of them in the book, but some of them are, are you know, would read less well, I think, than, than they're told. So uh, Jeff and I had both interviewed in years gone by T.C. Boyle, or as we now call him, Tom Boyle. And he lives in um, near Santa Barbara in uh, the first prairie style home that Frank Lloyd Wright built west of the Mississippi. And so 
and it's a kind of a compound. I mean, that sounds too fancy, but you have to ring a doorbell to get into the, and then go to the house. And so he, Jeff and I are standing there and we're both kind of, T.C. Boyle, he's very tall. He always wears red Converse sneakers and he's very, very, very smart. And he said, he, so, so we were both a little nervous about this interview. And, and so we get to the, to the gate and, you know, Jeff says, well, ring the doorbell and say we're here. And I say, well, why do I have to ring the doorbell and say we're here? Jeff, you ring the doorbell and say we're here. And Jeff said, no, you do it. And so we're like bickering, like, you know, 10 year old kids. And then the next thing we know, Tom Boyle comes out of the gate and says, well, the doorbell's um, broken. So I came out to meet you. <laughs> so, so that was one story. Another very short story is that when we interviewed Madeline Miller, in um, Philadelphia, of course, the, the wonderful author of Circe and Song of Achilles. Um, we went to her house, which is uh, on the main line, and um, her two little girls were there, one of whom, one of whom had, had given up clothing. So, you know, she had taken, you know, to heart the clothing optional. So she had given up clothing. And um, we, you know, we talked to them a little bit, the kids, and then they went upstairs with their dad and Madeline and Jeff and I talked. And then the kids came down when we were done to say goodbye to us. And the older one, who I think is like four, said to me, she looked at me, you know, sort of looked me up and down and she said, you're old, aren't you? And I, and of course, Madeline and her husband are going, oh God, so embarrassing. And I said, I am old. How did you know? And she said, your hair. So I think I might have to dye it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I think you could dye it green or blue. Right, right. But, um, yeah, that's... So. Oh, the truth from children. Yes, indeed. <laughs> They're so great. I, um, I know that we're here to talk about HarperCollins and um, the Writer's Library, but I just want to make sure that everyone knows about Book Lust and Book Lust to Go. And isn't there another Book Lust book? Uh, there's more Book Lust, the one that came in between, and then Book, and then book Crush for right, Kids. Book Crush is the teen one. Right. Okay, and then I also have your novel, George and Lizzie, here, which, and so Nancy's been writing for a long time, and she's been published by a variety of publishers. Um, I can't tell who this, oh, Touchstone did George and Lizzie. Look at yeah. that. Sasquatch in the Northwest did Book right. Rust. And so Harper Collins is very, very lucky to have you in this particular work. Um, I got to hear you and Jess Walter talk earlier this week about these. And so that was a lot of fun to hear you talk to them um, and tell us about the book. So I know a little bit about the book too. And I've like checked through the galley. So that's really wonderful. I, uh, was curious about um you disagreed on philip roth we did <laughs> was we, there anyone else really really like not notable that you disagreed on i know that I mean, philip roth feels sort of household namey for many right. right um the other person we disagreed on is dennis johnson oh <laughs> and I, I am not a Dennis Johnson fan. They're a little too grungy for me. Although I am a fan of his poetry, which is kind of strange. Um, luckily, he didn't have to like flip a coin or anything to decide whether to try to interview him because he's no longer living. So that, or, or is Philip Roth, because I think if Philip Roth were alive, then I, I, I could not have denied Jeff that. And there is, there are some wonderful Philip Roth n novels. Uh, you know, I have my favorites among Philip Roth novels, but he isn't the highest on my list of, of authors. <laughs> this is hilarious to me. So one of the things that I, that I value about you so much, Nancy, is that um, you and I do not like the same books. Yes. And we don't have overlap in our favorites. It's one of the things that makes talking about books with you very, very enjoyable because you'll be like, oh, Aline, this is the most wonderful book. I just read it. At the end of it, I was in floods of tears. And my response is, I'm never going to read that. <laughs> <laughs> but we do agree on Georgette Hayer. 
We do. We do agree on Georgette. And yesterday, I have to say, I just finished listening for like the umpteenth time to Pharaoh's Daughter, which nice. is one of my favorite, favorite Georgette Hayers of all time. We and have the complete works in our house, including the mysteries over here. Yeah. So any yeah. of my Massachusetts friends need to borrow one that's hard to catch, um, let me know. Uh, I had, you know, there were some wonderful questions that the registrants submitted in advance of our conversation. And one of them is that I'm gonna, so, so someone says, is there a poem you would like to share that speaks to these times? And I gotta tell everybody to friend you on Facebook or follow you on Facebook because you're sharing a poem every day. Right, or Twitter. Are they on Twitter as well? Yeah, there you go. Well. Nancy underscore Pearl right. is her handle on Twitter. So you can get your poetry on with Nancy there. Um, and, but has being at home altered for the last three months, altered your reading in any way? Uh, I think that being, uh, the short answer is yes. I think that um, what's altered my reading, I think the last four years my reading has, has altered. Um, it's been very hard for me to read, I would say heavy books. I don't wanna cry anymore. Um, which is why I spend a lot of time listening and re-listening to Terry Pratchett and Georgette Heyer. Um, but being at home, I think I've been doing a lot more rereading, um, going back to old favorites. Um, and, and I think that's partly because I think what's been hardest for me, and I suspect hardest for a lot of people, is that we just don't know. We don't know really anything about what's going to happen. And, and that unpredictability is so hard, very hard for me to deal with. Um, I'm the sort of person who tends to read the last page of any book because I want to know how it ends so I can either prepare myself or I can look forward to that wonderful ending. Now we don't know. And that uncertainty has been making me, has been driving me back to some of my, to many of my old favorites. We've been doing a little bit of favorite revisiting at our house too. Um, we love Connie Willis. Yes. And one of the rereads that we wouldn't have I wouldn't have expected us to really be able to tolerate, but the Doomsday Book was so paralleling everything that we were experiencing, and we were listening to it, and it's got a wonderful reader. Uh -huh. um, it's available on RB Digital in some libraries in the area, if you have it, uh, and I, I suggest that as a sort of epic, cathartic sadness. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, as I said, I don't want to cry in any book. And uh, that one is one that I read at the exact right time right. when I read it. And since then, I have always been like, oh, I never recommend Doomsday Book. But, um, yeah. So that rereading is definitely a place of comfort. And one of the reasons that I am a romance reader myself is because I don't have to read the last page. I can just have faith that it's all going to be okay. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and, so, that, and that's the joy of romances because yeah. they're... I mean, it's not a weak, people sometimes say that's a weakness of romances that you know what's gonna happen, but that's the pleasure of romances. I mean, I, it, like in Pharaoh's Daughter, the minute that Max Ravenscar walks into that gaming house and encounters Deb Grantham, oh boy, you know exactly what's gonna happen. <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> you love it. I, I have, um, I'm too anxious to not, N to not read a mystery where justice will be found or a romance where happiness will be found because the world is so unknowable. And I was anxious before the pandemic and there are lots of reasons <laughs> that, that I like to read something that's, that's predictable for good or ill. Uh, one of these other questions is, this one is good. What are some of the most important skills librarians should have? That is a good question. Um, I, I think that that one of the one of the most important skills that a librarian should have 
is I think they need to like interacting with people. I think that customer service, although, you know, I still call people who use the library, library patrons, um, and we're serving them. I think that customer service is, is something that is so important. And um, if, if we don't have good customer service, if we don't make every person who comes into the library feel as though they're important to us, I think we can, we're heading down the wrong road. I think, um, and and I think there's another question coming up uh, also on that list. But there, the other thing I think when we talk about readers advisory, which you know you and I are both so um, interested in, um, I think the most important thing for people who are interested in doing readers advisory is to continue to fight for its existence. In, in libraries because I think that for many libraries, what we call reader's advisory, that is putting the right book into a, a library user's hands, a patron's hands, has, has become less important than other important things. Um, and I could go on about that. <laughs> <laughs> we could go on and on and on. I think that connecting readers and watchers and listeners with their next great read, watch, or listen is one of the most important things we can do. And I am so fortunate to be working in a library right now where that's a real priority and I'm able to make it a priority for myself and my colleagues. Um, so thank you. Thank you to the Forbes Library in Northampton for that. I forgot to tell y'all where I work. Um, there so did you and Jeff come up with this idea for the Writer's Library yourselves? You were like, we want to dish with cool people? Yes, yes. Um, yes, we did. And um, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, the, the way the process works, I wrote to my agent, Victoria Sanders, who agented um, George and Lizzie and said, here's an idea that I and a friend of mine have. Do you think everybody would be, you know, anybody would be, any publisher would be interested in this? And she, you know, wrote back immediately and said, yes, we have to talk about it. And so, you know, you write up a, a, a book, a description of the book and, you know, comparisons to other books that are like it and, um, and sample interviews. We did two interviews in Seattle, um, uh, one of Charles Johnson and one of Lori Frankel. Um, so, uh, you know, to just give people, give the editors a, a, um, a sample of the kind of interviews that we're thinking, we're, we were thinking about doing. And I'm so thrilled that the publisher the, the publisher who bought the book, the editor at Harper One who bought the book, is Tara Parsons, who also bought George and Lizzie when she was at Simon & Schuster Touchstone. So it was a joy to work with her on George and Lizzie, uh, a real joy. She was a fabulous editor for, for me for that book. And she was just great for this book as well. That's so. Great. And what we wanted were really chatty interviews. You know, we didn't go into the interviews thinking about, oh, we have this list of questions. And we didn't have the same questions, you know, we didn't, that we, it ended up that we didn't ask the same questions of every author, which I think is what, part of what makes the interviews so interesting, because we really allowed the authors to talk about the place that reading had in their lives and what it meant to them um, with, with us not saying, um, you know, you, you know, what's on your to be read list or something, uh, you know, things like that. We usually started out with me asking either were they a reader as a child or what are they reading now? And both those were just great um, stepping stones to the rest of the interview. Yeah, that's one of the real powers of this particular work is that it is, it's like deeper and more intimate and more personal than 
the New York Times book review by the book column, which is like my favorite thing in all of <laughs> all of p newspapers is the by the book column. And I, I love to hear it, but they have the same questions and you can tell they do it by email and they have like a sketch artist do a picture of them. And they're great and they're charming. And I want to know what writers are reading and what they remember from their childhood. But the organic nature of your conversations with these writers just makes it so you're just right there. You want to be like, oh, you know, my friend Tom reads right. books now. <laughs> it's, it really puts you in that place. And if you're, a, if you're a gossip magazine person and a librarian and a reader, it's, it's catnip, really. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, I've interviewed a lot of writers over the years. The, the, um, the TV show Book Lust with Nancy Pearl we, we, I started doing that in 2004, so that's a long, long, long time that I've been interviewing uh, different authors. And there are a lot of, uh, there are some authors that I've met and interviewed who I ended up feeling not as fond of as I did when I had invited them to be on the show um, <laughs> because of, you, you, you know, egotism or something like that. You text me that <laughs> list. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that would be fun to dish. But, but these 22 authors that we interviewed for this, I ended up liking each one of them more than I did even more than I did when I went in. And some of these authors, Russell Banks, for example, um, I, you know, I adored um, for years and decades and decades. And, and, uh, and then there were some writers who are brand new, not brand new, but who, are, who haven't achieved the kind of renown. We have several Pulitzer Prize winners, Andy, Andrew Sean Greer, who wrote Less, we, we, I mean, that was wonderful to meet him, and um, and I and I was chair of the Pulitzer Fiction Committee that chose that book, so that was a really nice thing to do. Um, that was really fun to do. And then there are some writers who are going to be. There were two writers that we interviewed who happened, two women who whose books both happened to be finalists for the National Book Award. Susan Choi won. Um, uh, and Layla Lalami's book was one of the finalists. So, I, yeah, we were very lucky. Um, you know how to pick them. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I was, um, and if you want, if you go watch some of Nancy's archived shows on the Seattle channel, you might find her to be, as Jess Walter called her the other day, the Mike Wallace of literary interviewers asking the really tough questions. I thought that was hilarious when he said that. I know because that's not what I think about myself is doing at all. I mean, I sort of look on that TV show as a way for the authors to show themselves off and I love it. You know, we always talk about their books. I, um, I, I met Russell Banks at ALA in Anaheim in 2012. And he was there with Harper Collins because he had won something. I don't know, but it was some after party that I w got to be introduced to him to. And I was like, that's really cool. They make movies out of your books. <laughs> sort of showing myself <laughs> there. Um, what else? And he told this wonderful story, Aline. He grew up really very poor in upstate New York, moved around a lot. He was a real troublemaker in school. And w when he was, I think, in the fourth grade, his teacher, and he remembered his teacher's name, Mrs. Doherty, said to him, you don't have to come into class. I have asked the, um, the janitor in the school to build this big, big, big plywood table for you. And we're going to leave it in the hall. And you're going to take this whole semester to do a big map of Brazil showing everything about Brazil, the history and everything. And that's what he did. And he said that's what introduced him to reading, the power of reading. Plus, it got him out of that classroom. I'm sure he was really happy about that. That's amazing. I, did you find readers, writers, writers who were not readers in your As group? children? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
uh, Dave Eggers, who is just this wonderful, wonderful human being. And I have to say that Jeff and I, when we finished that interview, we, we've begun calling him Saint Dave, um, <laughs> because he just is so generous with his time and, 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 and supporting the community. Um, in San Francisco. Um, he wasn't a reader. He had a little bit of, um, of dyslexia and it took him a long time, you know, when he showed us some of the books that he had loved as a child, they're, the, they're big oversized books that are mainly pictures. And then when he was in high school, maybe the ninth or 10th grade, he read Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune. And he said it just took him to another place. and. And since then, he's been a reader. And his wife, Venda Levita, told us this story that she became a reader. Her father was like this inveterate um, uh, uh, thrift shop person, buyer. And, and, you know, they would go around to all these different thrift shops. And he bought a huge bookcase and books to go in it, the old books to go in it. And she said that she just made it her, you know, that's what she did. She would just read all of those books one right after another. She tells that story much better than I just did. But um, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I, um, my mom is a librarian. And so I was a reader as a, a, a small person. Um, I don't remember when the switch flipped. I know that some folks know when the switch flipped for them at like nine or ten or whatever but i don't know when that happened and as soon as i got to be 11 or 12 i started picking up the book my mom put down to go cook something and reading what she was reading and then we'd have the little tussle over who got to read it um that i i don't i think my mom might be out there hi mom <laughs> I, I sent her a link so she could watch us she was very excited to meet you on one of your trips out to her library Yes. Um, I have another question. I have to take my glasses off because of the glare and then I can't read. I already asked that. What about, so this one, I, you know, I came up with this and I think that it sounds, it doesn't sound very nice, but I mean it nicely. <laughs> What's it like for your family to live with a reader like you? Are you, is your family all readers? Um, Nobody is a reader in my family as much as I am, but we did have in my in my family in my growing up family um, we were all readers and though it was not a particularly happy family, we did have a rule that if all four of us were at the dinner table, uh, we could not read. But if there were any, go the other way, <laughs> yeah, but if there were, but, you know, it mostly just was praying that my father would not be there for various reasons. Um, but if there were three of us, we were readers. And my sister and I, uh, you, you, my sister and I loved the same books. And we did many um, book quizzes, you know, like uh, the Betsy Tacey and Tib books are some of our all time favorite books. And, um, you know, like one of us would say, well, what's Tib's favorite color? And then we'd have to think back of, about all of that. Um, so we, you know, my, my older daughter is, uh, they're, they're both readers, but they have lives. And, you know, I, I, I don't have a life outside of reading, I have to be honest. Um, <laughs> But a million um, lives in books. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Reading is awesome. Let's see, what do we have? So, um, we, our president acknowledged at the beginning of the meeting um, that we are living in a a world right now full of, of strife and concern. And um, one of the questions was, do you have book ideas for um, white readers to be better citizens? And you can think, and I'll hold up a couple of books while you think if you want to. Because okay. we've got Ijeoma Aluos, so you want to talk about race. And she's in right. Seattle, so you probably know her. Right. And, um, we've also got 
I, ha I don't see this one on every list. And so How to Be Less Stupid About Race by Crystal Fleming is also a good one. And it's, it's, a, it's got a sassy tone to it, which is, um, makes, it's very easy for me to absorb when someone's being snarky. And then Me and White Supremacy, this is a galley, so it's got my Library read sticker on it, Combat Racism, Change the World, and Become a Good Ancestor by Layla Saad. And this, there's also a workbook that you can buy off of her website. And there are, um, there are journaling prompts and reflections in this one that are really good. So those are some things that are on the bestseller list now and people are talking about. And I am also interested in stories of black joy. And so if you have any suggestions to share with us, we would welcome them. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'm not really, w whenever I do book talks, I, I always try to focus on books that are not bestsellers you know, because I feel like m my niche is books that you might not find unless somebody tells you about them. Um, so I, some of the books that I loved by African-American writers are Angela Flournoy's The Turner House, which is a fabulous novel set in Detroit, a mystery set in Detroit uh, by an African-American writer featuring um, an African-American, Mexican-American detective is August Snow by uh, Stephen Mack Jones. I just loved, I loved that book and not because I'm from Detroit. There's two books, two satires, um, older title, a little bit, of, one quite old now and one less old that I thought were would be so good for um, where they're just wonderful novels and they're by African-American writers and they're very, very um, satiric. And one is um, Paul Beatty's, um, oh my gosh, what is that? You know what, I'm gonna send you the list. I see somebody wants to, to, to type up the list. I will send this list of, of books. So one is Paul Beatty's um, new book, which was which did win, I think, the National Book Award. And the other is an older novel called Erasure by Percival Everett. And Percival L. Everett is one of those writers who never writes the same book twice. Oh, The Sellout is the Paul Beatty book, thank you. Thank you, Maura. Um, <laughs> I don't have the chat open because I have my notes open. You're lucky. <laughs> it's jumping up. It's jumping out at me. Um, and so, so Erasure is so good. And when Jess Walter, who is, an, is a fabulous writer as well, wrote Beautiful Ruins, and my favorite book by him is Citizen Vince. When he was talking about Erasure, he was saying that he was, um, he, he, when he was rereading it, he kept thinking every few pages, he would say, oh, Percival L. Everett is satirizing that, and now he's satirizing this, and now he's satirizing me. So it's one of those books that is, um, just, just so wonderful. Sarah Broom's Yellow House. I would recommend people to go back to Gloria Naylor and read Mama Day and Bailey's Cafe, both of which are such wonderful, wonderful books. So, and I, but, and I'll, I will send this list. As That's wonderful. As Thank you. I've got someone off screen taking notes furiously and, and a lot of mention <laughs> has come up in the chat. So that's wonderful. We are, um, we're grateful to you for making those suggestions. And I, I heartily endorse the ones that I was waving my hands around during. Because <laughs> and right. I'm always trying to make suggestions to readers that are recent publications because you know, yes, I read Mama Day, and that was 30 years ago at this point, and it's a wonderful book, and there have been lots of, I'm trying not to rest on my library, um, my library school laurels and, and keep up with things. So I am, um, I don't, what was I going to say? <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. Oh, just trying to keep up with keep up with new things and pay attention to new things. And you know, while we're at home, we can listen to book buzzes from various publishers, and we can drop into collection development in a way that we can't when we're on the desk all day. We're still working very hard from home, and that's wonderful. And um, that is one of the I consider one of the challenges to 
um, ongoing readers advisory service is keeping up. You know, I've, I've known you for years and I know that you read everything and I know myself and I know that I hardly read anything, but we're both really focused on connecting people with good reads. So what do you see as the, where did it go? Um, <laughs> it, it's a great challenge in reader's advisory service for the future. You talked about keeping it important. Right. And I'm very focused on keeping it up to date and keeping it inclusive. Um, what else do you see as a challenge? Well, I think, I think the inclusivity is really important. And I think the, the, besides enjoying it and sort of getting over that desk paralysis, which is something that I've tried to, to help people do, is realizing that, that when you're talking to somebody about the books that, they, that, they're, that they've read or the books that they're looking for, they're sharing with you their lives. And, and being a librarian, being someone who's in that position to help someone find a book, all you know about them is that bit that they're sharing, but they're sharing a lot. And I remember an experience of, um, of somebody, uh, of me saying, me making sure the library ordered a book because I knew this particular library patron would want that book. And when it came in, I, you know, said, oh, you know, here's a book I think that you would really like. And she looked at it and she kind of paged through it. And she said, I'm just not in the right place to read this book now. Can we wait a while? And I said, of course. Now, you know, who else hears that kind of, has that kind of interchange? Ex social workers or, you know, psychiatrists or psychologists, of course. But, but this is, this is talking about, a book and and you know it's why i think reading is so important is because everything that we read we both learn from and we gain empathy from um and i think that <laughs> certainly the second is something that is sorely needed in 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 the world today um, yeah, I grew up in Detroit, a very urban, very urban, of course, and my librarian, my children's librarian, Miss Whitehead, that I wrote about, you know, written about very fondly, um, is someone who really gave me the world by, by, you know, she knew I was this miserably unhappy child, and she, she just gave me the world, and some of the books that she gave me the Hundred Dresses by Eleanor Estes, which is one of those books that you just, it, it, it says it all. But, but the book that I remember that, that really, in, really enlarged my scope in the world, really made me understand there was a world that, that was bigger than my house or my neighborhood was Strawberry Girl by Lois Lenski, which won the Newbery Award and is about um, a family, her name, the little girl's name is Birdie, I believe. I have not read it for like decades. Um, but whose father, whose parents, whose family follows the strawberry harvest. Um, and, and what did I know of, of, you know, seasonal workers like that? I knew nothing in, until I read that book. Another book that did that same thing is Doris Gates' Blue Willow. And, and both of those, oh, you have to go, you must, you must find that book. It's so, it's, it, it, they're just amazing. So, you know, libraries, what we do in libraries, we are the only place, public libraries, the only place where, you, where people can come to talk about books that, you know, all, everything else that we do in many ways is duplicated or should be duplicated in other, in other government entities. But wow, sharing books, nobody does that. And I, I, don't, I don't want that to be lost. And I don't want that to be, to not be a, a qualification for library of the year or for, any of those kinds of um, awards, because nobody does that, and except us. 
And we love to do it. Yes, we do. And we love to get better. We love to get better at it. And we know, I mean, the other thing about doing good readers advisory work is that you just have to ask yourself, you don't have to read the whole book if you're not enjoying it. You just have to ask yourself, what kind of reader would enjoy this book? Is it someone who would who loves a page turners? Is it someone who loves, you know, three-dimensional characters? Is it someone who loves to be transported to a different setting? Um, you know, one of my one of my friends used to say, I would say, what are you reading, Martha? And she would say, oh, Nancy, I feel like I'm there. And, you know, and that doesn't, that's not the kind of book I like. I, I don't need that in a book. But, and there are some people, you know, it, who, who, what they're interested in is just beautiful language in the book. You know, they, they want to write down quotations or tweet poems all the time. Um, and we just, we just, we don't have to read a whole book. Obviously, this is like very short and um, <laughs> a micro mini reader's advisory workshop that I would do. We, um, you might, you might enjoy this story. We were discussing literary fiction at our reader's advisory roundtable a few weeks ago. And we, it was sort of like, is this literary fiction? Is this literary fiction? And um, those of us who were facilitating the meeting sort of came to the conclusion that if Aileen doesn't want to read it, it's probably literary fiction. <laughs> because right. There were all these things that were like edge cases. And, and it was like, I don't want to read that, so it must be literary. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the whole problem with genres, you know, dividing, dividing, um, dividing books, putting books into different categories, because, um, yeah, because what that does is kind of rank the kind of books and make people embarrassed about reading the kind of books that they, that they're reading. And here's a funny romance story is that um, a, 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 a woman came into the library and she said, um, you know, I was on the desk and she said, I, she said, I love romances and um, th but the only problem is I don't want any sex or any violence. I don't want, not, well, there wouldn't be any violence. She said, but I don't want any graphic sex at all in the romances. And I said, oh my gosh, I have just the perfect author for you, Georgette Hayer. And I took her over to the shelf. And luckily my favorite Georgette Hayer was on the shelf, which is um, The Grand Sophie, also a wonderful audio book. And um, I, I said, oh, he tried this and, you know, it, it put no sex at all in this book. And so she took it home and then she came back the next day fuming. She was so angry and she, you know, she came up to me, naturally I was on the desk again, damn. She came up to me and she said, this book is full of sex. And I said, where? What? And she said, look at this page. He ejaculated. She ejaculated. He ejaculated. They ejaculated. And I said, oh, oh, but that's ejaculated was a synonym for said. It was another it was another um, a, a, a verb that people used at that time. And then this and then the woman said, um, well, okay, that's okay, but what about this? Sophie had in easy intercourse with the military gentleman. So I took another breath and, and I said, well, that's another uh, expression that we don't use right now, but that indicated, a, you know, she talked to them very easily. So you never know. That's why censorship is so ridiculous, because you never know what my favorite t-shirt, um, what used to be, there's something in my library to offend everyone. And I used to think that would, that's the definition of a library. But the kind of, um, you know, the other thing is, it's not terrible if you suggest a book to somebody and they don't like it. You don't know everything about them and, and you're going to do well sometimes and you're not going to do so well sometimes. And even if they come back and say, and you want them to come back and say, I didn't care for this book, because the more you talk to somebody, the more you find out about the kind of books that they would enjoy. And, the, and, and it's a discussion. It's not a lecture and it's not, what you like, it's what they're looking for. 
so. Yeah, I have, um, I have a few readers who come into the library. I miss them desperately. And I, after placing holds for one reader for a few months, I, I was talking to her one day and I said, how do you find the books that you come to place holds on? Because they were always library reads, picks, or, you know, not bestsellers. And she said, well, you know, my daughter tells me about them and I look at the book page and everything. And so the, ne the next time she came in, I said, I think you might want, I think you might enjoy this book just based on some of the stuff that I get for you. And it was, um, this is how it always is by Lori Frankel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, it's about a family and what's going on with the family. And I, and she said, yeah, that sounds good. And I gave it to her and she went home and told her husband about the interaction. And we've, of course, since become more, more uh, engaged with giving each other books. <laughs> and he's like, she's got you pegged. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's a, it's a lot of fun to sort of, sometimes I have uh, folks tell me, it's so hard to get people to let me talk to them about books. And I don't wait for people to come to me. I'm always wandering around in the stacks. And if somebody is paused by the Lisa Scott and Laney books, I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know she has horses on her farm? And, you right. know, I start making, to start talking to them about what they're looking at or, you know, and then I have some people who look at displays regularly. And so every now and then I'm like, hey, how do you, what do you like here? And, um, right. I've got a few people into my clutches, and I managed to lead a Michael Connolly, Robert Crace, Robert Parker reader to Lauren Willig somehow. Oh, wow. She likes justice and adventure, but she was really liking the interpersonal relationships, so that was fun. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's great. That That's, and then, you know, give that person, um, what are those books, um, Oh, the soulless. Oh, the soulless books. The character. Yeah. yeah, I always think, I think about her. Like those. Yeah, in terms of Lauren Willig, especially yeah. for those. Uh, well, and oh. she's she's game. She trusts me now. She you know she knows that I. It's not. I don't want to trick her into reading something she's not going to like. That's not why I'm here. Yeah. So. Right. One of the things that I thought was so interesting, going back to. Um, to, to Lori Frankel is the, she was, because we talked to her so early, she was the second author that we interviewed. Um, Lori reads, when, when we talked to her about how she chooses the books to read or, or what, she said she reads books so she can learn how to handle different situations in the books she writes. So she's really reading to learn. Um, and her, for example, she said the new book, the, the book that's just well coming out, I think later this year maybe, um, is set is told from the point of view of three different people. And she said she was looking for books that were told from multiple points of view, so she could see how these authors did it and learn from that. And I was surprised at the number of writers who said that kind of thing. That they that they read to learn from the books that they um, that they were reading. That's wonderful. Some of the writers I know have to try specifically not to do that. I know. I think yeah. that there are you know obviously everybody comes at their work in a different way, but I I know writers who are like I can't read anything while I'm on deadline and right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's yeah. great. I thought it was really interesting. I have some books I should tell Lori to read. I, I'm thinking of things to tell her about. <laughs> well, that book's done. I'm sure she's onto her new one. Probably so. <laughs> she's pretty incredible. Yeah. So um, I have gotten through most of the questions that I have. And hey, Aline, we should start to wrap up. Just came through the <laughs> chat personally. So um, I wanted to, I have a little list of things that um, I need to say which include renew your membership, Massachusetts Library Association members. And while you're at it, check that little box next to the reader's advisory section. We would be <laughs> happy to have you join us. Um, I want to really thank Nancy for coming and HarperCollins Library Marketing for facilitating it, Virginia, Christopher, and Lainey. And I want to thank Joanne Lamoth for letting me talk to you. She was like, I'm setting this up with, with Virginia and Chris, and do you want to talk to Nancy? I'm like, yes, yes, I want to talk to Nancy. So I'm really grateful to them, to Joanne for that. We are hoping that the 2021 conference will happen 
May 17th to 19th at the Cape Cod Resort and Conference Center in Hyannis. And fingers crossed for that. And if it doesn't look like it's gonna be able to happen, we'll have something more online than just a business meeting next year. We'll have a, a true virtual contest. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to have you here. Do you have any final words of wisdom for us? I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for having me. I know this was a business meeting and we added this on and um, I'm just so grateful. Uh, to all the librarians out there for bringing joy into the lives of their patrons. And, and thank you, Aline. It was when you emailed me saying you were going to be the one to interview me. I, it was so nice to see an old friend. And um, yeah, yeah. So thank you. This has been a real treat. Thank you so much. There's applause coming from everywhere <laughs> off screen at my house. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to see you on the internet sometime. Bye. Bye.